All right, guys, today we're going to talk about World War II, the world at war, 1935 to 1945, the greatest conflict in human history. Nothing even comes in close second place. World War I is like a country mile behind. I mean, holy cow, there's nothing that compares. So, all right, where do we start? Well, how about here? The rise of fascism. Fascism. So what is it exactly? Probably good to know because as I write this, on the day after Donald Trump has been sworn into office as the 45th President of the United States, or POTUS, people around the world, not to mention tens of millions of Americans, are already calling him a fascist. And the guy hasn't even actually done anything yet in office? It's a term that's been thrown around very loosely ever since the days of World War II, and usually in the Vegas sort of way. So, uh, I remember at punk rock gigs back in the day, in the early 80s, we used to call the cops, you know good fascist pigs, man, with our mohawks and safety pins on our noses, and yeah, that was me back in the day. But anyway, yeah, okay, so, all right. Uh, let's try to arrive at a legitimate understanding of just what this system of government was that was shared by our enemies in World War II, the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese, and not to mention some other governments such as the Spanish and some Latin American governments too that were termed semi-fascist or pseudo-fascist, Brazil and Argentina. So, okay, fascism. Uh, there's a 17-part definition of fascism, but for God's sakes, who needs that? Pfft. Now, the five-piece definition goes something like this. One, a one-party dictatorship, wherein you have two, complete state or government control of production, three, characterized by very extreme nationalism, and a four, Total suppression of all opposition to the government, rounding it all up with Cinco, an ideology that identifies some one or more ethnic or racial other as the source of many, if not all, of the problems that have beset the nation for such a very long, long time. Okay? Fascism. So, who were the fascist powers, the Axis, Germany, Italy, and Japan? Let's try to make some sense of these three countries that were the bad guys, the enemy, that the United States, the Allies, fought against in World War II. Okay? So, the case for Germany. Yeah, in Germany... You had this odd little goof with the bad teeth, which is why he wore that dopey mustache. Adolf Hitler, jawohl, a decorated veteran of World War I, but a failure in life who annoyed everybody he met because he had this terrible bad breath, he had wretched, horrible breath, dragon breath, man. To go along with the bad teeth, the bad teeth made the bad breath, right? And a grating personality... All right, just he was, Adolf Hitler was just an annoying pain in the ass to everybody that he met. He felt in the very marrow of his bones, okay, the failure, not just of himself, but of his nation in the aftermath of the Great War. That's what they call World War I until World War II came along. Of course, they also called it the war to end all wars. <clears throat> but clearly that didn't end up making a lot of sense either, right? You know, as a result of which Germany had been very, very unfairly punished, Hitler sat and drank in bars where veterans of the war hung out, as well as unemployed men, and he found that he had the gift of gab, the gift of running a line of rhetoric past these men that managed to not only remind them of everything that had been done to Germany after the war, and which was in large part why they were so miserable now, 
but that was also able to rally their spirits around a vision of a better Germany that was waiting for them just down the road in the future. By 1923, Hitler's popularity amongst these disaffected and angry men had grown so large that the government, in fear of this cult of Hitler that was spreading throughout Munich, they jailed him, threw him in the can, simply because they didn't know what else to do with the guy. He scared them. And it was in prison that Hitler began to write his autobiography and political manifesto, Mein Kampf, which translates into my struggle. But before we go any further, let's take a moment to consider just what it was that Hitler and Germans in general were so angry about in terms of what had happened at the end of World War I. In 1917, <clears throat> there was every likelihood that Germany might have been on their way to winning the war or at least concluding a more or less honorable draw after another year or two of protracted, drawn-out trench warfare. But it was then that the United States entered the conflict after the Zimmerman telegram was delivered to President Woodrow Wilson. And within a year of American troops getting into the fight on the side of the Allies, the war was over and Germany and the Central Powers had lost. Now, for those of you in Mexican-American history, uh, you know, you already know about the Zimmerman telegram from previous lecture material, right? Okay. For those of you, you know, just coming into this at some random way in YouTube or whatever, you know, Google it, okay? I'm not going into it here. All right. Now, the peace process that led to the Treaty of Versailles was long and drawn out and characterized by the spirit of vengeance on the part of the British and French, because never in all the history of warfare had nations been so bloodied by a conflict as they'd been bloodied by the Great War. Every war before it had been like a string of firecrackers. World War I was like a keg of dynamite. Economies shattered. An entire generation of young men wiped out. Nations turned upside down. You know what they called the 1920s and early 1930s in England? They referred to it as the generation without men. And what they meant by that was that there was almost no young guys to date or to get married to, because every young guy that was healthy enough to fight went off, joined the war, and either they got blown to smithereens and were dead, or they'd had limbs blown off, or they'd been hideously disfigured, <clears throat> okay, or driven insane by what they'd seen. So that, that kind of 15-year period was characterized by all these young women in England who literally had no prospects at all <clears throat> as far as dating went or getting married. The generation without men, okay? So the British and the French were a bloody well jolly good absolutely going to get even with these bloody Germans for what had been done to them, <clears throat> okay? They were determined to be compensated, paid back for what they had lost. The only nation on Germany's team in the war that had the long-term wealth and earning power to pay them back was, yeah, Germany. So it was decided that the Germans should bear the whole brunt of the losing team's side of the conflict and be blamed for the loss of the war, <clears throat> and be forced to pay war reparations far out of any sort of proportions as to what any other nation had ever, there's a typo there, been forced to pay when on the losing side in any great conflict of this sort. Guys, no country in the history of war had ever been punished in the way that Germany 
was punished after World War I. Okay? Ever. <clears throat> so, okay, Dave, you say, what did they pay? Well, I'm glad you asked. They paid, or were supposed to pay, France and England all of the money they spent to fight the war. They had to surrender their colonial empire in Africa to the British and French, as well as valuable territories to the French in Europe. The Rursar, you gotta say, I like the French, right? You gotta get your, get your, get your, get the red up in your nose, the Rursar, Besson, huh? valuable real estate, tremendously valuable real estate on the Rur and Sar rivers, okay? The reason this real estate was so valuable is it was chock full of factories, okay? And really valuable agricultural real estate, okay? The Germans had to turn that territory over to the French. They also had to give up having their own military. They weren't allowed to have an army anymore, a navy anymore, okay? And their leader, the Kaiser Wilhelm, he had to abdicate the throne, leave the country, go into exile, okay? And on top of that, they had a new government imposed upon them by their enemies, all right? I mean, these last three things in particular were just downright humiliating to a proud people like the Germans, and to make matters worse, to put the cherry right on top of the Sunday, the treaty contained what was known as the War Guilt Clause, in which it was asserted that the Germans were to blame for the war, like the whole thing. All of that tremendous loss of life, wealth, property was their fault, and only their fault. Everyone involved in crafting the Treaty of Versailles knew that this was nonsense, nothing but a slap in the face to the dignity of Germany, but they went ahead and they did it anyway. And so, while the U.S. was fat and happy with money, 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 money during the Roaring Twenties, as everyone was paying back their war loans, and we were living large. In Germany, the economy was in a shambles. The winters were harsh and characterized by people dying of starvation and exposure. And here's Hitler talking about the unfairness, the mistreatment of Germany, reminding people of what's been done to them, promising that if only the Germans will listen to him, the greatness will return, and soon. It wasn't hard to convince people. Reminds you of Donald Trump a little bit, huh? It also made it easier when scapegoats could be pointed to. And Hitler had made it abundantly clear in his speeches, and then more so in Mein Kampf, that the Jews were to blame for Germany's woes with their control of the international banking cartels. And as time went on, he would create more scapegoats, include all peoples, really, that were not pure-blooded Aryans, basically anyone not of Germanic bloodlines or close cousins. Hitler had a whole theory of history that went back to the beginning of mankind, built upon a simple Manichaean dichotomy, wherein all people were divided into two groups, culture builders and culture destroyers. The former, the culture builders, were responsible for everything good that had ever come about in the world, and were the Aryans, again, Germans, and close relations, the Dutch, the British, and the latter, culture destroyers, were nothing but blood-sucking parasites who sought to ruin everything that the former had achieved. Everyone else in the world, but particularly Jews, 
and mud people, people with dark skin, Africans, Native Americans, Australian Aborigines, Asians, okay? It was a nitwit ideology suited to a pea-brained intellectual, but then it was never supposed to convince anyone with any real brain power of anything. It was written by and for lowbrow intellects, and it succeeded in the way that it needed to. It gave a certain segment of the German population an oppositional other to point at and say, Oh yeah, that's them. They're the ones that ruined us, brought us down. They did it to us. Because it's always easier to point the finger of blame at an other than it is to look in the mirror and point it at yourself. At any rate, Hitler promised a return to prosperity, a Third Reich, or age, of German greatness. His theory of history posited that German had, Germany had already had two previous ages, or Reichs, of greatness, and the third one was coming. And with his promise, pardon me, and once out of prison in 1925, and with his promise to the government to pursue political power strictly through the democratic process, and the ban lifted on what became the Nazi party, his political party, and on his public speaking, the way was laid open for his advancement to higher office. Ironically, in early 1933, he was appointed Chancellor of Germany at almost exactly the same time that Franklin Roosevelt was becoming President of the United States. A little typo there. And so the door was open for the establishment of his long-term plan to make Germany master of Europe. Okay? So there's Germany. Now, let's talk about the case for Italy. Momento. Italy, too, had her dictator. Benito Mussolini. But before we really get into him, it may surprise you to know that the country that you know of as Italy was only constituted as a nation as recently as the 1860s. Prior to that, it was a collection of smaller political entities such as Naples, Sicily, Sardinia, etc., all independent from one another, each small, weak, and ineffective. You can see it here on this map, right? Today, you have this country that's basically this, okay? And we call it Italy. But if you look back here, okay, back in the late 1800s, you have Venetia and Lombardy, and you've got, you know, Tuscany, and you've got the two Sicilies, and all these different smaller things, okay? Well, ultimately, they were unified in the late 1800s into a new modern nation-state, Italy, okay? Well, by the time that Italy had become unified under one government and gotten up on her feet and was ready to sort of say, hey, ready to rock Europe, Italy here, new kid on the block, joining the All-Europe Club, well, by that time, it was the 1890s, and the rest of Europe could hardly be bothered to notice, which is a little irritating to the Italians, because remember, once upon a time, they were the Roman Empire. Once upon a time, they were everything in Europe. Back when England, Germany, France, those countries were nothing. Yeah. 1,500 years ago, okay? A long time ago, right? Okay. The Italians, they wanted to reclaim some of that glory, get some of that mojo back. And so they started thinking about, well, how do we do that? 
How do we get the big kids on the block? England, France, Germany. How do we get them to, to notice us? And it occurred to them that what they needed were some colonies, like the big kids in the All-Europe Club. I mean, even the small fry in the All-Europe Club. Portugal, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal. They had colonies, right? So Italy says, yeah, colonies, sure thing, but where? Because the thing is, by this time, all of the colonies had sort of been taken, conquered, gobbled up. They were all gone. Nothing really left over for latecomers to the party. Terribly sorry, old chaps. See, a process had begun in the mid-1800s that historians have described as the scramble for Africa. And that process led to a mad dash by the colonial powers, like a bunch of starving construction workers at the end of a long day on the work site for a half dozen extra large pepperoni pizzas. Everyone charged off to Africa and grabbed and conquered as fast as ever they could. And within a matter of a few decades, all of Africa had been placed under colonial control. The entire continent wrapped up, done. Nothing left for Italy, except maybe one spot. Just one. Way on over there in East Africa, a swinging little joint called Ethiopia was available. The old name for Ethiopia was Abyssinia. Okay, so hey, maybe that was where the Italians could stake their claim and start to build up the beginning of some street cred for themselves on the colonial stage. Okay, let's sig the map here for a minute, guys, right? You know, it's very simple, color-coded. Belgian colonies. The Belgians had one gigantic colony, the Congo. Okay, you can see the British are rocking. They've got a tremendous number of big pink colonies, a lot of real estate. The British and the French are really the two dominant powers. Okay, Germany, this is way before World War I when they're stripped of their colonies. Okay, German, Southwest Africa, German East Africa, Cameroon, etc. But you get the idea. Okay, now you might be saying, well, what about the rest of the world? Can't the Italians get something somewhere else? The rest of the world was colonized way before Africa. In other words, Asia, Australia, Indonesia, India, the Americas, and all that. That's all done. Africa was the last big piece of the world to be colonized, okay, at the time of the scramble for Africa, all right? So, okay, what a, here we are, Ethiopia. This may raise a question in your mind. Why would Ethiopia have been unconquered if all the rest of Africa had been colonized in the scramble over the last few decades? What made Ethiopia so special or so uninteresting, so undesirable? You know what? I'm glad you asked me. The answer comes down to one cool cat. Emperor Menelik II, one of the cagiest and the most far-sighted rulers in modern history of any nation, African or otherwise, Menelik had looked around him at what was happening in Africa, and he realized that if something wasn't done, then Ethiopia was going to fall just as so many other African kingdoms were falling to European imperialism. Ethiopia was not on the early conquest list because she did not have extremely valuable resources, nor did she lie in a geographically advantageous position. But her time would come, and Menelik vowed to do all that was within his power to forestall that eventuality. And to that end, he made contact with the Germans, with their government, created trade agreements whereby German military advisors would come to Ethiopia 
to help train and build a modern German-style army for Ethiopia, armed with the best German weaponry. Then, thought Menelik, let any of the other European powers come to Ethiopia, and we will see if they put us to the test. Well, they didn't, because, again, Ethiopia was not a wealthy nation, not advantageously placed, had a very difficult terrain to invade and fight within, and was now very tough on top of all of that. But guess what? The Italians never really got the memo, okay? They weren't really clued in on this. When the Italians arrived with their military force, Menelik deemed it wise to arrange a treaty with them, ceding some territory to them that was of no value to him, if only to maintain a peace, spare the lives of his people, and see if things just, you know, might be maintained on that footing. But in time, the Italians wanted more, and so war broke out. And at the Battle of Ottawa in 1896, the Italians, outnumbered five or six to one, were completely destroyed by the Ethiopians. Crushed, hosed, hammered, obliterated. And not only that, humiliated in the eyes of the all-Europe club that they'd hoped so desperately to impress. Because it wasn't bad enough that they'd been beaten in their big debut on the colonial stage. But it was the worst defeat that any European army had faced at the hands of an African force since the Romans were beaten by the Carthaginians at the Battle of Cannae in 216 B.C., about 2,200 years ago. Yeah, that's what you call a serious bummer. When Hannibal beat the Romans, you know what I'm talking about? Hannibal, you know, with, with the elephants crossing the Alps. Like, yeah, like back then, okay? But now, it's the 1920s. And Mussolini has come to power. And he believes in this idea of spazio vitale, or vital space, which Italian fascist ideologists have used to identify the Mediterranean basin, okay, or the land around the Mediterranean Sea, as a space which historically belonged to Italy or Rome, and which, by implication, should belong to Italy again. That's what they said. Mussolini is dreaming of a resurrection of Roman greatness. And unfortunately, a lot of that old Roman territory lay to the north. And that's clearly going to bring him into conflict with his new number one pal, Hitler. And he doesn't want that, because Hitler is much tougher than he is. Okay. Italy cannot stand up to Germany, not for, you know, even a month. Okay, he knows it. So he's looking south and southeast towards Yugoslavia, towards North Africa, towards parts of the world he feels confident about picking on. And he's remembering Adoa. Yeah, Adoa. Ethiopia, okay? But more on that in a minute. After we make the case for Japan. Okay. So let's hop on our jet plane and pop around to the other side of the world to Asia and try to make some sense of what in the devil was going on with Japan at the same time, more or less. To do so, and let's start like so. For a variety of reasons, in the 1630s, the Japanese government chose to isolate the islands, Japan, from the rest of the world, allowing almost no commerce with the Western nations at all. Okay, the only trade they allowed in 
and out of Japan was through one Dutch trading post in one town. Okay? So for all intents and purposes, they cut themselves off from the outside world. And this policy continued for over 200 years through the 1850s. At that time, Japan was opened forcibly to Western trade by the arrival of four American warships under the command of Admiral Matthew Perry. Once the die was cast and the change had come, the Japanese found their society torn strongly in two directions. On one side were those who might loosely be termed the modernists, allied with the emperor, and on the other side, the traditionalists, strict adherence to the Bushido code of the samurai and devoted to the shogunate or the military government. Each side had their European backers, with the British backing the emperor and the French allying with the shogun. Ultimately, the two sides decided their affairs in the Boshin War with the imperial forces or the emperor's forces with the British backing them prevailing, they then established the Empire of Japan, after which a program of headlong modernization and industrialization was outlined and pursued with military aggression perceived as the necessary catalyst for expansion and success. There are several signature differences that set the historical experience of Japan apart from that of Germany and Italy at this time. One is that Japan was not ruled by a singular charismatic dictator. They didn't have a Hitler, they didn't have a Mussolini. Okay, instead, they had this hereditary emperor who was kind of removed and above, okay, set aside, set, sort of sort of distant from everything, okay? And then they had this military government, a group of men, who managed the day-to-day -day administration of the empire. The other thing that made Japan different from Germany and Italy was the position of China. China occupies a place in the minds of the peoples of Asia that is simply not in any way pardon me, comparable to that of any nation in Europe in the minds of any other European people. China is the oldest continuous civilization on earth. For 5,000 years, the Chinese have been there, being Chinese, doing the Chinese thing. In many ways, and in vast areas of the country, even now, changeless and unchanging. Empires rise and fall. The earth turns and spins its way around the sun. China endures. Japan, for all she ever accomplished, was always just a collection of islands off the coast of ancient, mighty China. Many historians argue that a major part of Japan's drive for greatness in the late 19th, early 20th century was to show China that the Japanese, too, could achieve great things, and in fact, become so great that they could bend China to their will, as only the Mongols of all other Asian peoples had ever done in the past. Recently, of course, China had been deeply humiliated by the West, by the Europeans and the Americans, by the so-called white devils, conquered and colonized, enslaved by opium, forced to pay embarrassing taxes to the Western powers. The timing had never been better to show China up and also prove that Japan could stand shoulder to shoulder with the Western powers. And so it was that the Japanese came up with their plan 
for the expansion of their own imperial greatness, that plan to be called the Greater Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere of Influence. Under this plan, the Japanese sent out emissaries to the various areas of Asia that had been colonized by the Europeans and Americans, China, Vietnam, Korea, the Philippines, etc. They asked the indigenous elites in those colonies if they would not rather be rid of the white devils who had imposed themselves upon them with violence and destruction. Wouldn't they rather be free? Well, sure came the reply. But what's the catch? No catch, came the Japanese answer. Just listen. Now, you guys listen to me. The Japanese were sort of the unluckiest people in all of the history of the world that ever wanted to build an empire, because they just happened to live in a country that was almost totally devoid of all of the resources that would help to do that. Their home islands were practically empty of iron ore, oil, rubber, various valuable minerals, all of the things that you need to make guns, bullets, gunpowder, explosives, planes, tanks, ships, etc. So what they proposed to these other Asian peoples was this. We will come to your country and kick Syria's ass and drive the white devils out. You, in return, will kindly supply us with the resources that you have in your country and we need to continue to fuel our national war machine so that we can expand our glorious empire and free all of Asia from Western imperialism. Oh, and, and by the way, allow us to rule you once the white devils are gone. And so we Japanese will create a greater Asian co, all of us together, prosperity, but we the Japanese will certainly be most prosperous of all, of course, sphere of influence, our glorious empire, it'll be great. What do you say? Well, all of those Asian elites contacted by the Japanese said, we think we prefer the devil we know over the devil we don't know. The white devil over the Japanese devil. The French or the British or the Dutch or the American devil over the Japanese devil. So, thanks, but no thanks. In other words, they turned them down. They all turned them down. They all said to the Japanese, no. And so the Japanese, irritated, a thousand times over because no one wanted to join their Asian cool kids club, realized that they were just going to have to conquer everything and everyone the hard way. And that's exactly what they set out to do, starting in 1931 when they invaded Manchuria, an industrialized province in northern China. This provoked an international outcry from the League of Nations, but little more. And later, in 1935, when Italy invaded Ethiopia, the same lukewarm, tepid response prevailed, and mainly because these parts of the world were far removed from the main concerns of the Western powers, which made up 90% of the nations in the League. Their eyes were anxiously fixed on Hitler and what he might do in Europe. That was the main issue. And until the Japanese became far more aggressive in other directions, and nothing else really mattered. But within a relatively short period of time, push led to shove. Adolf Hitler, in spite of all of his protestations of peaceful intentions, kept increasing the size of his military, threatening his neighbors, and annexing pieces of their countries. By 1938, the concern over his action had grown so large that the leaders of the West insisted on a face-to-face -face meeting en masse, and so the Munich Conference was held in Germany, at which time Hitler reassured one and all that his intentions were simply to reunify the Germanic-speaking peoples of Europe into one greater Germany, and that no one need fear war on his part. 
his actions in negotiating away pieces of his neighbor's countries had to do with unfair treaties over the centuries where pieces of Germany had been lost to other countries, France, Poland, etc. And it was time that these pieces of Germany be reunited. This is a photo from the Munich Conference. Here you see the Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, Hitler. Uh, how can you miss that, right? Or that. Here's Mussolini. I mean, scary, right? Would you let your daughter marry this guy if he showed up at the front door? <laughs> no, okay? So it was time that these pieces of Germany be reunited with Germany proper. The American delegate to the conference, Joseph Kennedy, the father of JFK, the future president of the United States. Here he is right here on the cover of Time magazine. Whoops. Kennedy, he came back from the conference. He reported to FDR. Kennedy, by the way, was the ambassador to England at this time and one of the wealthiest men in the United States. He came back. He said to FDR, Hitler is a megalomaniac. He is going to try to take over everything, and he is not to be trusted. What Kennedy said to FDR more specifically is he said, I did not get to be one of the wealthiest men in the country without an ego. I understand the ego. I understand the ambition. When I looked into this man's eyes, I could see exactly who he was. He is going to try and take over everything. His ambition knows no bounds. Okay? But the thing is, no one wanted to start a preemptive war. World War I was still fresh in their minds like, 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 like it was yesterday. Right? So, hoping against hope, they chose a policy of appeasement to use Neville Chamberlain's term, letting Hitler have his way in the annexation of these little pieces of real estate here and there, basically taking bites out of neighboring countries and hoping that this would satisfy his hunger. And meanwhile, every day that went by, Germany's military got larger and larger, becoming the greatest military power the European continent had ever known. Finally, in the summer of 1939, Hitler was ready. He launched his Blitzkrieg, or lightning attack. And within several months, it was all over. Like three months. Most of Western Europe had fallen to the Nazis, and England stood alone against the overwhelming strength of Germany. It was at this point that the president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, knew that without our help, England would fall. But Congress had passed the Neutrality Acts in 1935, shortly after the Italians had invaded Ethiopia, even as the Japanese and the Chinese were fighting in Manchuria, and his hands were tied. He could not help the British. In addition, he knew that American public opinion <clears throat> was staunchly isolationist. At this point, we did not even want to help the British against the Germans. Not at all. Why don't we want to help England? How is it then that, that we get in the war? It's summer of 1939. By January 1942, we're in, dedicated, committed, all in. How is it that we changed our minds? Well... We'll pick that up next time, okay, in the second half of the lecture. Talk to you soon.